there are two common ways that nuclear reactions actually generate energy. Fusion and fission. In fusion, two elements are squeezed together to form a single heavier element. And in fission, a single heavier element is split apart, creating energy in the process. So the first obvious question is why can't we continue that kind of splitting and squeezing the same elements, creating an unlimited supply of energy? Well, this, of course, would violate the first law of thermodynamics. And the key to understanding why it won't work is down to knowing what elements produce energy from fission, and which do so from fusion. Only the very light elements, most notably hydrogen, produce energy from being fused together. Once you progress up the atomic scale to iron, this process is actually reversed. Fusing iron together actually uses up more energy and it actually releases. And the reverse is so with fission. Heavy elements like uranium used in conventional nuclear power stations will release energy when they split apart. But if you try to split a lighter element like say oxygen apart, again you wouldn't gain any energy from the process. Our nuclear power stations have been generating energy for decades now. They all generate their power from fission, splitting apart different heavy elements. And whilst these power stations are capable of producing substantial amounts of energy, they also produce significant amounts of radioactive waste. So why can't we generate nuclear power from fusion instead? Nuclear fusion has two substantial advantages over nuclear fission. Firstly, potentially it could create more energy than fission, and secondly, there's virtually no radioactive waste produced from a fusion reactor. So why isn't nuclear fusion the way we generate our nuclear power? Well, to understand this, we have to look at the two ways we have observed nuclear fusion going on before. First, most obvious place, the place we see every day, is in our sun, where mainly hydrogen is actually being fused together, generating the main source of energy for our solar system. Inside the sun, hydrogen atoms are, don't just kind of wander around near each other and randomly merge and generate energy as a result. Instead, tremendous heat and pressure within the heart of the sun squeeze the atoms so tightly that they fuse together. Stars in general, the larger the star, the greater these conditions are, the more rapidly the hydrogen atoms are fused together. So a large star runs out of hydrogen quicker than a smaller star. The other way we observe nuclear fusion going on is in an atomic or nuclear bomb. Our first atomic bombs were created using nuclear fission. These were powerful enough. Soon people realised they could get an even bigger explosion to be able to harness the process and power of nuclear fusion. The issue was how to actually reproduce the conditions present in the heart of the star. The way it was used basically to trigger a nuclear fission bomb and try to contain all the energy from that event long enough to then release the nuclear fusion energy in the other part of the device, basically creating a temporary sun within the bomb itself. Now, neither of these two methods really make for a practical method for generating safe energy. So some scientists and others looked at whether it was possible to get atoms like hydrogen to fuse together without need for all that heat and pressure, and what came to be known as cold fusion. The problem here, of course, is that hydrogen doesn't actually want to fuse together. Two hydrogen atoms come close to each other, they'll form a strong chemical bond, which is extremely stable, they won't actually fuse together to form a new element. And whilst the initial drive to create fusion energy around room temperature attracted many of the world's top minds due to its huge potential benefits, initially, and these people could see a way around the problem, Many deemed the whole concept of cold fusion as impossible. But part of the reason why that thinking that cold fusion is impossible is by looking at the whole universe around us. It's been around for a little less than 14 billion years. Even outside of all of the stars, the most abundant element in our universe is hydrogen. Now if hydrogen outside of stars naturally just fuses together to produce heavier elements and then releases energy in the process, why then is there still so much hydrogen about in the universe? Why wasn't there more heat energy being generated outside of our stars? So given the observations, there are still some people working on cold fusion. 
and in 1989, two people working together claimed to have produced energy using cold fusion. There are many initial attempts at replicating their experiments, in which some appear to generate some excess heat energy. When these claims were checked, though, doubts started to arise as to whether any fusion had actually been produced. There wasn't any of the expected byproducts of the fusion process actually present. At this stage, that many of the claims of having replicated results were also withdrawn, so we're now put down to just pure experimental error. The reason behind this error is that the potential benefits of the technology meant that quite a fairly large number of scientists had attempted to repeat the process and produced no results, whilst others had produced an energy loss and some an energy gain. Attention, of course, was initially focused on those that reported an energy gain. But when these were viewed in with the alternative results, it appears that all that's happening was a standard experimental error in trying to record small changes in novel experiments with some rather delicate and difficult to calibrate equipment. This false dawn for cold fusion has led many people to view the whole cold fusion process as just a pure pseudoscience. However, it may not be quite as simple as that. It does appear that any kind of ordinary chemical or physical process is not going to enable the atoms to overcome their kind of resistance being fused. However, it may be possible to use some methods which are out of the ordinary. These methods are likely to involve either imparting some energy to one or both atoms, or by adding some other kind of particle into the atom mix. Whilst the result won't be quite the cold fusion as it was originally envisioned, it may still be able to produce nuclear energy with little or no waste products. So whether it's accelerating hydrogen atoms so they smash into each other, or using slow-moving neutrons to merge with the hydrogen atoms, or using muons to kind of kickstart the fusing of the atoms, there's still room for hope on cold fusion. You just have to avoid jumping the gun when it comes to claiming significant results. The problem here is that doing things quietly and carefully and checking all the results before making public announcements doesn't tend to attract the attention and funding that more demonstrative or spectacular projects do. There will always be the temptation to rush to publish results that might not always get you good science in the process.